Welcome to the Myth and Magic Authors Podcast, folklore and fantasy topics aimed at creative storytellers. To write stories and challenge your brain with exciting ideas, delve into these presentations and reflections. See how fantasy realms are based on actual world history, legend, and lore. Study fairy tales, nature fables, and supernaturalism to engage in a jumble of concepts that will trigger your fancy and get you writing imaginatively. Now, here's your host, Neil Mack. Hello, fantasy fiction fans. Now, if you're like me, presently preparing a fantasy adventure for this year's NaNoWriMo, then I would like to encourage you, please, to consider shifting the fashionable tropes of fantasy and flipping around those worn-out stereotypes. So, for example, why do wizards have to be enlightened old men? Why do they have to be wise why do they have to be old? And most importantly, in my opinion, why do they have to be male? Why do they have to be humanoid? Why can't they be incorporeal? Why can't they be multicellular? Why can't they be cyborg? So, with those kind of notions in mind, and I've chosen The Hobbit as a source, I wanted to offer a few mind flips I think might help you develop some alternative and perhaps excitingly fresh concepts. So here we go. Number one, the protagonist. Does your protagonist have to be honourable? Does she, he or it have to be upstanding? How about creating a protagonist who's unsavoury? How about creating protagonist who's unreliable and does your protagonist have to be withdrawn and aloof why not create a protagonist who's proud as a peacock and is filled with boastful swagger why don't you create a protagonist who's basically a show-off number two the mentor does your mentor character have to be venerated and cobwebby in other words, does he have to be an old guy with white hair and a staff? Does the mentor have to be unquestionably trustworthy? Because we all know older people, don't we? Don't older individuals sometimes make mistakes? Don't older individuals sometimes get forgetful? Number three, the fairy queen. Does your Raw blood fairy have to be elegant and come to that does she have to be feminine why does she have to have long silvery shining hair does she have to be proud does she have to be strong does she have to be stubborn what about the queen of doubts what about a fairy queen who is dubious about her or his or indeed their place in the universe what about a gender fluid character what about a fairy who's confused by everything, including their own identity? Number four, the elves. Do your elves have to be puckish characters? Do they have to be capable with a bow and arrow? Why not portray them as therapists or nurses? And do they have to be impressive and proud? What about drunken and undisciplined and unruly elves? Number five, the magical other world. Does your Rivendell have to be set in a deep valley? Why does your magical other world have to lie beyond the mountains? Why isn't the magical other world right here under our noses? Perhaps the magical underworld is in the pedestrian subway. Or perhaps the magical underworld is under the floorboards of your favourite store in the mall. Number six, the Dark Lord. Does your Dark Lord have to be a guy? Does she or that or they have to be absolutely evil? Or might they simply be lazy and unintelligent or insensitive? And why does your Dark Lord have to be a humanoid figure at all? 
why can't it be a crocodile or a multi-headed thing or a worm or an amphibian? Number seven, the dwarves. Do your dwarves have to be bearded little men? Do they have to be perversely stubborn? Do they have to be fearless warriors? Do they have to carry axes and hammers? How about creating civil and exquisitely polite creatures that are loving and they're cordial and they're gentle? Why not portray your dwarves as peaceful, enlightened creatures who prefer learning and compassion, perhaps, to combat and to working in mines? Number eight, the magical item. Does your magical item have to provide the user or the owner with some kind of impregnability? or some kind of superpower, or could it be wickedly, I admit, could it be that it offers quite the opposite, and it becomes a horrible enslaving thing? Perhaps it's a irresistibly compulsive object, like a junkie's bong. And we know, don't we, that an addict uses the bong to escape a harsh reality. Or perhaps it's another compulsive object, like a game addict's handheld video, which is also used, by the way, to escape into another world. Number nine, the dragon. Does your dragon have to be snake-like? Does it have to be reptilian? Why not like a lion? Why not like a dog? Does it have to be visible at all? Maybe it's just a force which lurks imperceptibly in another dimension. Why does your dragon have to be smart? Why does it have to be huge? What about a mini dragon the size of a caterpillar that sits on your finger? Why does it have to be cunning? Why not stupid? And why does it have to possess superhuman strength? Why don't you make your dragon powerless and fallible? And perhaps that's why the beast is so darned angry all the time. Number 10. The Trolls. Do your trolls have to be represented as monstrously large humanoids? Why are they humanoid at all? What about jellyfish-like? or scorpion-like? And why do trolls have to have bad table manners and working-class accents? How about coming up with enhanced trolls who are sophisticated and who are remarkably advanced life forms and they're noted for their superior intellect and their wisdom? Wouldn't that make them surely more troublesome enemies than working-class jobs? Number 11. The Orcs. Do your orcs have to be debonic? Do they have to have fangs and bow legs and long arms? Why not depict them as sexy? As apex predators, with no natural enemies, aren't they more likely to be very sophisticated? Because don't forget they're sophisticated hunters. Are they not likely to live in family groups ruled by a mother figure? Aren't they more likely to be inquisitive creatures that have evolved over the eons ingenious skills such as thought transference and clairvoyance and teleportation which will aid them in the pursuit of their prey? And wouldn't such attributes make them genuinely menacing enemies? Number 12. The Setting Does your setting have to be a medieval type European looking place? with mountains and lakes and forests and swamps. Why doesn't your Middle Earth look like the Australian Outback, for example, or the tundra in Greenland? Why does it have to be like Earth at all? Why doesn't this made-up place smell of toffee and it comes caramel-coloured, with volcanoes that spill frost and with islands made of syrup that are stranded in seas of lichen and moss? Why isn't your Middle Earth pink in summer, blue in autumn and velvet in winter? But in winter it becomes unpleasantly fetid. So there you are. There's some ideas to turn things around and to tip things upside down for your next fancy fiction project. And if you want to um, say hi to me, I'll be working on NaNoWriMo this November. If you want to come and say hi, I'm Neil underscore Mac, N-E-I-L underscore M-A-C-H, on the uh, NaNoWriMo profile. Good luck with your prepping and good luck with your writing. What is 
a frame story and how to use a frame story in your next fiction project. A frame story, which is also known sometimes as a sandwich tale, is a literary technique that serves as a companion piece to your main narrative. In other words, it's a story within a story. The main point of a frame story is to allow your readers to follow another secondary narrative in addition to the main narrative line. A good example of the use of a frame story in literature is with 1001 Nights, where a character narrates a set of tales to a listener over several nights. So each one of those tales is a separate story, even though they're all contained within the one larger story. Emily Bronte used the same technique in Wuthering Heights to tell the story of Heathcliff and Catherine, along with their individual subplots. And Mary Shelley in Frankenstein also used multiple framed narratives within the same book. Tolkien suggests that Hobbit Bilbo Baggins wrote a memoir of his early adventures, which was titled The Red Book of Westmarch. And the author used the notion of this book, which was uncompleted in Tolkien's case, but although it was a frame story which was incomplete, it added credence to the legend of Middle-earth. And Tolkien is himself said to have been influenced by the epic poem titled The Earthly Paradise, which is by William Morris, the artist William Morris. And that was a story that followed a group of medieval wanderers who all exchanged their own stories to each other on their trek to keep each other motivated. So I'd just like to go through the rules of a frame story and then perhaps you might be able to think of a way to use it in your forthcoming project. So here are the rules of a frame story. Number one, to be successful, the frame story should act primarily as an occasion for telling other stories that are, of course, outside the main narrative. So it's not a way to offload and lots and lots of backstory. It's supposed to be a complete story, but outside the main narrative. The second rule is that a lucid dream or some type of dream vision that's experienced by one of your characters and which tells an entirely different and independent story would be a frame story. So you can use it in that way. A narrator's tale, perhaps an instructional or a guiding narrator might accompany the main narrative and this will perhaps serve as a clarification or insight and as long as it tells an entirely different story to the main story so it becomes part of the narrator's own experience then it would be a frame story and a good frame story ought to add something to the overall texture and the mood and the experience of the main narrative it might bring tension or it might bring relief. It might shed light on something that's complex or difficult for you as the author to describe. Or it might shed light on something which is difficult to reveal or establish. For example, a nuance or a trait. And it might be a nuance or a trait that hasn't come to light yet. And perhaps never would if it wasn't for the frame story. So it's a very useful way to add texture and add nuance to your main narrative but within its own story setting. So let me know if you've been successful and you've used a frame story perhaps in the past or you are thinking of using a frame story in the future. And that is what a frame story is. And that's how to use a frame story in your next fiction project. Good luck with it. Let me know how you get on at nilmac, N-E-I-L-M-A-C-H. Next week, I'm speaking to the editor, Aidan, who's a really nice guy, from the Etheria magazine. It's a Australian speculative fiction magazine, and they've set out a new space for fiction writers, but especially for science fiction and fantasy fiction writers, to display their talents. It's a great new project. We are supporting it big time here and we're really excited to talk to the editor of the Etheria magazine about what they want to see from a short story before it gets published in a magazine like theirs, the future of fantasy fiction publishing, the future of magazines in general. We're going to talk about creating and writing for magazines and we're going to hear about 
how an editor chooses the right kind of material for a fantasy magazine. So you've got to tune into that and there will be an opportunity for you to contribute, I think, as well. So next week, I'm speaking to Aidan of the Etheria magazine in Australia. 